Hello, everybody, and welcome to BB Book Buzz. This is the November edition. Uh, we were just saying it's still November, and um, it seems like a long month. And we have with us today Casey Tweeko, who is our head of youth services, and Beth Radcliffe, who is um, a reference librarian, and I am Karen Stern, head of reference. And we're all here to bring you um, some of the books we've been reading in hopes that you can find your next great read. Um, good variety as usual today. And we're going to start with Casey. All right. Um, so I uh. have with me uh, Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. Um, it came out last year. It was originally a um, self-published book that got a lot of popularity and is now published by Tor, which is known for its science fiction fantasy. Um, and I'm not going to talk as much about Legends and Lattes, although it's the only one we had in the room, but actually the new book that just came out in November, I believe, that's called Bookshops and Bone Dust, which is actually a prequel to this one. But just to give you kind of, it is described as a novel of high fantasy and low stakes. So, um, which is actually really like a perfect description of it because basically the idea behind it is the main character, Viv, um, is an adventurer who has now retired um, and she moves to a city she doesn't super know um, but has been through a bunch of times and in this one she decides to start a coffee shop and coffee isn't super well known in, in the world, it's only in like a couple places and so it's like a whole new thing. And so the whole story <laughs> is basically, um, you know, a lot about Getting her... people addicted to coffee? <laughs> yes. Honestly, yes. That is, <laughs> that is a large portion of it. But it's basically, it's, it's her trying to figure out how to find a life after being on the road, adventuring, you know, doing violence for, you know, many, many, many years. And none of that comes back to her in the middle? A little bit of it does, but not not a lot. Most of it focuses on her just, a lot of it just affects how she looks at things. And mm -hmm. like, there's a lot about, as she goes through it, about her figuring out how to make a permanent home and right. make something, mm -hmm. you know, a home and to like, accept that she can make friends and she's not going to leave them, which mm -hmm. actually leads straight into the prequel, which Viv is still the main character, but she is a young, brand new adventurer and she very stupidly, um, in one of her first big fights, runs ahead and gets badly injured. Um, mm. She gets stabbed through the leg. And her crew um, leaves her at basically a, sea a sleepy seaside town um, to recover for how, and then they're like, we'll be back to get you, like, right. at the end of the season. <clears throat> um, so she's absolutely stuck because she can barely walk. Um, she also desperately wants to continue with the adventurers, so she's not going to leave without them. Yeah. Um, and she stumbles into um, the like local bookshop that's not particularly well um, traveled, and makes friends with the owner, mm -hmm. um, who's like a little. Um, a lot of them are very like, especially very like traditional fantasy um, species and races. Um, anything you'd find in like Dungeons and Dragons, but he does have this really cute little like four foot tall rat people that are very cute, the ratkins, <laughs> um, and the the um, okay, I gotta think the owner to think the, that a rat yes, is cute, but a, okay. but a big one. Um, <laughs> and the owner of the bookshop is a very foul mouthed ratkin, which is very unlike. They're usually very reserved and quiet, and so the fact that every other word out of her mouth is a swear word. Um, takes Viv very much off guard, but she can't help but like her. Um, she also meets the local baker, who is a dwarf, um, and the two of them have a, um, I mean, you, you can tell it's going to happen from the very beginning, so I'm not spoiling anything. The two of them have a very cute relationship, um, but with the understanding of Viv's leaving. Like, everything's written with the understanding of this is all temporary, and even though she's making friends, it's not going to last. Right. Um, and Bookshops and Bone Dust definitely has more adventure um, because the the person that her crew, Viv's crew, is after is in the region. And there things happen at the, um, you know, they she knows that Viv's been left there. So there's some things happening in the background and Viv's like on high alert and everyone's like, nothing happens here. And Viv's like, something's going to happen here. 
Um, right. So, so there get... is a little bit more adventure in right. bookshops and bone dust than there is in legends and lattes. Okay. Um, but uh, I was talking with one of our one of our coworkers as we were leaving, and she was like, "Oh, I could book talk that book, but it wasn't my favorite because nothing happened." And I'm like, "That is exactly the point. Like stuff happens, but it's not your traditional fantasy action adventure. Right. It is really, mm -hmm. you know, in, a, in the way that like a lot of what we would kind of call like literary fiction, like it's all about the characters and the setting and mm -hmm. the interpersonal relationships and like people." learning within themselves like this is that but with the fantasy setting background right um and it's so you have to go into that you have to know it's not going to be like yeah. well he's definitely fast paced but he's playing on if you think of all the bookshop books and all the yeah. coffee shop books yes. and you know he's definitely playing into that he's yep. giving you hints just by the titles yes. and the, um, and that it's a prequel does that mean you should read the prequel first i would actually suggest reading this one first okay um you certainly could read the other one first mm -hmm. um but i think the fact that you know how things end mm -hmm. and there's a the, there is an epilogue that comes to like a little bit after this time period um but the fact that you know how this one you know how her story mm -hmm. ends mm -hmm. actually i think makes the prequel that much better because right. it's like you know from the beginning she is going to leave like right. because you know she goes on to have all yeah. the adventures yeah. that lead her here um but in some ways that adds i think a poignancy to sure the story yeah. and yeah. the relationships yeah. that she develops there um and as i said there is a little epilogue that kind of ties the two together right um which mm. was really cute um so and will it, there be more i know that's what i was wondering he's definitely gonna write more he's actually um he is an audiobook narrator. Um, so if you oh. listen to audiobooks all the time, you might okay. very well have heard him. He narrates his own audiobooks, right. even though Viv is a female, you know, protagonist, um, but does an amazing job with it. I actually listened to um, uh, Bookshops and Bone Dust early. I was able to listen to it early, right. and it was fantastic. Okay. Um, and it, I liked it because, for me, I listened to audiobooks very slowly, and so the fact that I could listen to it and it, I wasn't going, what happens next? Because I'm like, right. well, it's, it's very, you know, yeah. chill. And, yeah. and so it was a really fun one to listen to for me because it's actually exactly the kind of book I like to listen to on audio. Just enough adventure, but also not that I can't sleep because I need to know what happens in the book next, <laughs> um, which is a lot of what I listen to because I listen to a lot of, like, middle grade that has a lot of action adventure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I either listen to short or it has to have not a lot, like, it's got to be a little bit slow, more slow moving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and obviously he does a fantastic job because this is what he, you yeah. know, this is how he got into the publishing industry and game in general. So, right. um, I, sus I wouldn't be surprised if he wrote more in the world. I suspect he might be done with Viv's story mm. right? just because there's nowhere really to go from this one. Mm. Okay. And mm -hmm. you can only tell so many other slow stories of her earlier life without kind of throwing off the yeah. whole point of this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he stuck with the world and, and the... Or a secondary character, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And, and also the, like, type of story that he tells with, like, doing that low-stakes, yeah. high-fantasy thing, I think he will stick with. Cool. Maybe um, the foul mouth. It's treating him well. Foul mouth dwarf. Yeah, no. I don't know. We'll see Ratkin. if... Um, the Ratkin. Ratkin. The Ratkin. Um, oh, that's right. <laughs> I, I would be perfectly happy for any of the characters, and that one in particular, to get some, some later history from them, so... Um, so yeah, if you're looking for, you know, something, um, actually some reading that talking about this, I was like, this is exactly the kind of book that like my dad's always asking me for. Maybe I should just get this one for him for Christmas. Um, so if you have somebody who really likes fantasy, but you know, enjoys kind of that, what happens after, or like thinks about that, mm -hmm. what happens after idea, um, which I think has become a little bit more prevalent in fantasy recently is kind of the story after the story. Yeah. And he, he hits that really well. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to go next, and I'm going to do um, two books again. I think I'm, I don't know if this is becoming a thing with me, but um, I, they, I happen to read these books back to back, and they just have kind of strikingly similar themes. Um, so I thought they'd make a good pair. And they're both new books, or newish anyway. Um, the first one is Lauren Groff's. The Vaster Wilds, um, and you probably know her from uh, Fates and Furies. She just wrote The Matrix before this one, which a lot of people liked. Um, 
And then the second one, I didn't have the, oh, it's upside down. I didn't have the cover, so I just printed it out, is uh, Daniel Mason's North Woods. Um, and the, the, the thread that ties them together is, um, is their focus on the land and nature. And in particular, the, they both start in the wildernesses that were this country mm. very early on, early, early colonial time. One, this one is in Jamestown starts, well, starts in Jamestown, and this one is around, more around Boston, possibly a little bit later than Jamestown, but, um, so. So a local it, interest. It, this one definitely has yeah. local interest, for sure, yep, and, and so it's all, but it's, it's very focused on nature and land, the land and the way that humans interact with it, mm. both of them. So you could kind of say it's, these are firmly rooted in, like, that Anglo- American literary tradition, you yes. know, everybody from Fenimore Cooper, because mm -hmm. this one is a real adventure in, you know, battling with the wilderness in the way that, you know, I don't know, The Last of the Mohicans or something like that, you get that kind of stuff in there, mm -hmm. to, you know, Emerson and Thoreau and maybe even uh, definitely Whitman, you know, it's just, cool. it's in yeah. that tradition, yeah. Those, these yeah. are, these are in that tradition, but there's slightly different take on it because you're looking at it from the point in history we are now right. you're looking at what we could be losing you know there's that sensibility mm -hmm. is all mm -hmm. in there so it, it isn't it's the same and it's different it's definitely part of that anyway um can i can, and, so, and so in, if people like that kind of literature that would be i a think good... that these would either yeah if you like early stuff okay um that would absolutely yeah. be okay. these good would be know. both interesting books to yeah. read um it's different from the early settler narratives. There's definitely not that idea of, like, the wilderness to be conquered, to be, right. um, you know, tamed, all that kind of stuff. It's much more about they're marveling at it, they're celebrating it, they're inspired by it, they're living with it in much mm -hmm. more um, than, than against it. You know, it's not, a, it's mm -hmm. not adversarial. Right. Um, and what these are not are tales told from the perspective of Native Americans, um, who obviously were on this land for millennia mm -hmm. before this and had lived with the land in their own ways. Um, both authors wisely avoid any of that. Um, they leave those stories to be told by the Native American voices themselves. So I'll start with Groff. And the, this is called The Vaster Wild, as I said. Um, it's, it's an intense first-person narrative. Like I said, it's an adventure story. It's a survival story. I, I was okay. honestly thinking, like, if you like The Martian by Weir, mm -hmm. <laughs> you might like this book because it's very different in style, so different in style. But um, it really is a first-person narrative. A young woman, she's been a servant for a family who came to Jamestown from London and, you know, if you remember your history, Jamestown was a horror show. It was full of death and disease and pestilence and infighting and all kinds of nastiness. And so in the first scene, she has just escaped from, from the settlement, which was besieged at the time. She's escaped. People are chasing her. And you don't know why. There's something terrible has happened as she's left the fort or the settlement. And you don't know what it is until the end of the book, which oh, wow. is, is part of the, the you yeah. know, the suspense yeah. and the mystery that gets you through. Mm -hmm. But um, she, she, um, she basically, over the next weeks, her only thing to do is to survive. And she obviously had some, net, you know, settlers at that time had knowledge of the land, yeah. but she's only left with a hatchet, um, a flint, a couple of coverlets, the clothes on her back, a cup and a knife. I mean, that's what she's got yeah. to deal with. And so she runs, and as she runs, she's learning about survival. She's learning through encounters with animals. There's this rogue kind of half-crazed European who's gone wild, um, who she has to take on. She ends up getting his boat. Um, she endures storms and um, injuries and fevers and bugs and, like I said, wild animals, mild poisonings, you know, anything that you can think of that could happen happens to her. Um, so without saying anything more about the ending, the, uh, she, she, the author all through this is taking you deeper and deeper into the magic and the mystery of the land and she's 
learning from it and she's growing from it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Not just physically, she, a, lot, a lot happens to her body, believe me, but spiritually and emotionally she's learning. Um, and, and Groff takes on some questions of God and nature and um, what it really means to be alive in the book. So that's that one. And then the Mason isn't a single narrative, it's many. But the, tie, the feature that ties them all together is the land itself. So it's mm. one place and the many, many stories that happen through that the place. ages cool. in that place. Hmm. Um, so the first chapter, funnily enough, also starts as an escape from a settlement. This is hmm. some settlement around Boston. And these two young lovers who have decided they can't take this, these crazy old folks and their, their <laughs> religion anymore. Their and they, they get out, they run into the woods, again, being chased by men with weapons, get away. And they, be, they make a place for themselves in the wilds of Western Mass somewhere. <laughs> um, cool. And uh, then, the, then the next, and to show you sort of the progression of the book, is the next chapter, a woman and her child from the same settlement, but a couple of generations on, um, are, have been taken by Native Americans in, you know, who are in reprisal for what has been done to them are taking hostages and they mm -hmm. kill most of her family and she's on a sort of a march and she and her baby both, she, it's she and her, her tiny baby, both get sick and they get dropped off at a woman's house who lives by herself in the wilderness and it turns out that this is the young woman who left mm. in the first mm -hmm. and she has now, she's now an old woman, she's survived two husbands, the second of whom was a Native American man and she lives there in the ways of the native people and um, she takes her in and there's another there's a, another thing that happens there which I won't go into but there's a brutal attack and just before one of the men gets killed in this attack he eats an apple and when his body is d buried in a shallow grave and the elements work on it for you know oh the better God. part of a year and some of it he has sort of floats back up to the surface a little bit all of a sudden, the app something happens to this apple seed. Um, and so wow. I'll just read you a tiny bit here. It grows warmer until the weather that gathers in the hoofprints of deer no longer freezes in the night. Now in the place that was once the belly of the man who offered the apple to the woman, one of the apple seeds, sheltered in the shattered rib cage, breaks its coat, drops a root into the soil, and lifts a pair of pale green cotyledons. A shoot rises thickens, seeks the bars of light above it, and gently parts the fifth and sixth ribs that once guarded oh the dead God. man's meager heart. The sapling grows through the summer. By the end of August, it has 18 leaves and is the same height as the haunches of a lynx. Hmm. And so that's just part of a little chapter that comes between the second chapter and then the next story, which is, of course, a soldier from the French and Indian War who decides who tastes of this apple tree, finds it completely delicious, and decides to start an orchard there and builds a house. And, and so it goes. Mm -hmm. And it's full of, um, I, you, there's a brutality. Um, you know, a lot of, quite a few people die in not very nice ways. Um, there are uh, love stories. There are family stories. There are ghost stories. Ghost stories are kind of cool because I think there are a lot of ghost stories in, in early American stuff and he sort of he plays on that a little bit and as you can hear from this the yeah. language is beautiful yeah. and his that's is a similarity to and that is a, definitely yeah. a similarity to Groff although their language is very different like his is pretty simple I would say as you can tell from this it's very descriptive in a beautiful way it brings you right into nature and hers as well but hers is intense I mean Lauren Groff if you've read anything she's written you know that she writes in a really intense style so I would say you know, to add to the, the things that people might like about these, both of them have beautiful language. Mm -hmm. I mean, she sometimes is almost too intense for me. Um, but uh, not, it's not a big book. It's not like they, either of them go on too long or anything in, in, their, description, in their descriptions. So I think there's a, there's a lot of reasons to, uh, to like both of these, um, Lauren Groff and Daniel Mason. Awesome. It, it sounds like wonderful writing to me. Yeah, it is really wonderful yeah. writing, both of them. Yeah. 
highly recommend. I really enjoy doing these because my like to read list always goes up. <laughs> it's stuff that I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> always pick up on my own. Right. Jackie always talks books. I'm like, oh, I want to read that one. I know. She put a bunch on my to read list. She's always got hers. great gossip novels yeah. too. <laughs> And I'm going to say the same thing about Beth's, having read the inside front cover of that, too. So. Yep. This is an exciting one for me. I want to read this one, mm -hmm. too. So this is, my book is uh, Thistlefoot by Jenna Rose um, Nethercott. Nethercott. Yeah, Nethercott. What a great name. Jenna Rose I know, Nethercott. Jenna, and it fits with her title, too, somehow. Yeah. Right? Um, so Thistlefoot is a reimagining of the Slavic Baba Yaga tale. Um, in the original, Baba Yaga is a terrible witch who eats children and lives in a house on chicken legs, which if you can see the cover, this yep. house is on chicken legs. That's an awesome cover. It's, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. We were just talking about how yep. it, like a cutout. It's yeah. really nice. The, the Baba Yaga in this story is not a terrible witch. She, is, she does have magical powers, but she's a Jewish woman who's trying to keep her daughter safe in 1990 Russia. Um, and she also lives in a chicken house. Okay. Um, and this is how uh, Nethercroft describes the chicken legs. It stands on its feathered thighs as thick as oaks, bulging under the weight they carried. So Thistlefoot begins in our time with estranged siblings who have been notified that they have inherited a package that they need to pick up in the Bronx. And I'm sorry, not the Bronx, Brooklyn. <laughs> Don't um, get those mixed up. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Which is... The chicken house. <laughs> and this begins a cross-country adventure um, that also goes back and forth in time. The adventure involves evil forces that are out to destroy the house, and that force can infect people with hatred, hatred of the other, or murderous envy that drives them to commit acts of, of violence. So it's a classic fairy tale. It's got the hero's journey. It's got the forces of good and evil, and a bit of romance. Our heroes, the estranged siblings, are um, a sister and a brother. The sister is Bellatine, and her brother is Isaac. The sister is methodical, she's straight-laced, and a carpenter, which fits, like you have to be exact with carpentry. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and she has powers that she's afraid of. Her brother, on the other hand, is impulsive, he's a con man, he uses his power to excess almost to the um, point where he loses himself in them. Are these adults? These are adults at the time of, yeah, yeah. the time they pick up the inheritance, okay. they're adults. Not yeah. old adults. They're right, just young adults. Young adults. <laughs> New adults. <laughs> New adults. Um, but there's also a third hero, and that is the house itself, the house on chicken legs. <laughs> um, and her story, because she is a female house, chickens, right? Got to be. Yep. Um, is interspersed throughout the, the novel. Okay and um, told by the house itself about her history and that of Baba Yaga. Hmm. The secondary characters are also really well drawn in this book. Um, and they have their own unique powers and their own unique eccentricities. Um, take Sparrow. What Nethercroft writes about Sparrow is, Sparrow, though looming enough to be written off as bronze, fizzed with a man scientist zest. Um, everywhere they travel, be it in the city or in the country, the author paints a really vivid picture, allowing us to be there with the siblings. Mm -hmm. Everywhere there is a story mm -hmm. that the locals tell them. There's also menace throughout the book, and it just builds and builds and builds as evil tracks them and gets closer and closer and closer. Okay. Um, evil, mm -hmm. in this case, wants to erase the memory of Baba Yaga and the program that killed everybody in her village. That is, except for Baba Yaga and her family. Um, if the house is destroyed, then the village never existed and history can be whitewashed. The atmosphere's growing intensity is relieved by humor. That of her brother, um, Isaac's brother, right. the brother Isaac, who's kind of like a trickster and he's got a really sly sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And the house itself too, because the house is a teller of tales. So it, it relieves that, that growing tension. Um, so this is really a rich 
layered debut. It's her first book, although she's written poetry. poetry. Yeah. Um, the central concern is how we preserve and understand the past through stories. Um, the book is particularly relevant today with movements that are trying to um, forget, have us forget history, to ban books. Um, whether that be the legacy of our country, the legacy of slavery in our country, or, or the histories in other countries or other entities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, she's trying to, uh, to work against that. Thistlefoot is a, it's a dark and difficult book, but it galloping on those chicken legs, <laughs> it's really weird and wonderful. Right. Um, and, and we were just talking about how the author... She, the, the language, I would imagine, is beautiful. It's beautiful. I mean, I just gave you those two little sentences, but it's... She's a poet, and she actually came and did a program for us at the library. I think it was during COVID online. And she can write a poem. You can just give her a few sentences Which... about a subject or about yourself or whatever it is you would like her to write about. And she, can, she sits on a typewriter and in front of you creates a beautiful poem just for you. It's a wild yeah. skill. It's yeah. an amazing skill. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't surprise me that the language of this yeah. is, is amazing. And also, I think, I think she may also do some artwork. I wonder if she has something I, to do oh, with good question. the um, cover, because it yeah. kind of reminds me of some things she showed us when, when we were online with her. And she lives, I think she lives up in Vermont or New Hampshire, somewhere up north. Woodlands remember. of Vermont, Vermont. beside an it. old cemetery. Yes. Oh, yeah. She's, she is all that. She has and an amazing... And there is a scene that takes place in a cemetery, yeah. She has an amazing backstory, yeah. Yeah. It's just, it sounds... I'm really excited to read that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, the language reminded me of your North Country. Right. North Woods. North, North Woods. Woods. Yeah. North Woods, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yep. Um, I would say read-alikes. Um, there's Jane Yolen's Briar Rose. Yep. Which... I don't think it involves as much as these extra powers mm -hmm. that this does, but it's a story embedded with um, Sleeping Beauty. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I think the one that really fits well is the golem and the genie, mm -hmm. which a golem is a, a clay figure that's brought to life by, by Jewish, um, I don't know if it's the rabbis or just Jewish people, but to help the Jewish people. And then genie, everybody knows what a genie is. Yep. So, that's going to involve a lot of magic and mm -hmm. adventure and stuff. Right. So. so that's Jenna Rose Nethercott. Nethercott. Yes. Jenna Rose Nethercott. Very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we hope that you've enjoyed uh, these offerings and uh, that you pick some up. Come by the library and ask us if you need any suggestions for other books. Um, we're always happy to do that at the reference desk um, and downstairs at the youth desk for the younger folks. So um, stop by and also join us again here on BB Book Buzz. We'll be back in the new year. It was good to see you. Take care. Goodbye.